Okay. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, my name is Steve Lewis, and I'm a senior director of RISTEC uh, based in the UK. Um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, and welcome to this RISTEC webinar. The topic of today is about DSEA, uh, the Dangerous Substances Explosive Atmospheres Regulations, uh, which is the UK implementation of the European ATEX uh, directives. Hopefully, we can provide some useful and practical insights uh, for you. Before we get going, uh, a quick spot of housekeeping. Uh, we've muted everybody, uh, so the sound won't be distorted by background noise. Uh, if you would like to ask some questions, and we really, really do encourage you to ask some questions today, um, then please use the instant messaging function. If you just click on that little white speech bubble in the bottom left corner of your screen, type your message in. I'll keep track of these, uh, and we'll aim to cover as many of those as we can at the end of the session. Uh, and certainly within the 30, 35 minutes that we've got available uh, today. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, RISTEC, just by way of very quick introduction, um, we're one of the world's leading uh, independent providers of risk and safety management solutions. It, it's all we do. Uh, we've got over 300 people worldwide across 16 offices. Uh, we're also part of TV Rhineland, uh, who are uh, sort of 2 billion euro provider of testing, inspection, and certification services. Uh, our main uh, sort of business line is uh, consulting. We offer a whole range of specialist uh, services helping to reduce and manage risk. Uh, we also provide online and classroom training uh, and postgraduate education, including an MSc in risk and safety management. Uh, through our resourcing team, we also offer associates um, who are available to work at client locations uh, to help fill any uh, resource or sort of skill shortages. Uh, we do actually provide some uh, inspection integrity management services as well. Uh, and also, we undertake risk and, uh, sorry, we also undertake uh, research and development activities in the field of risk and safety management. So next slide, please, David. So I'd just like to quickly introduce our presenter today, David. Um, David is a principal engineer uh, based in our Warrington office in the UK. He joined RISTEC uh, just over 13 years ago from a background in applications engineering. He's got a broad range of risk and safety management experience covering a whole uh, set of qualitative and quantitative techniques such as hazard, hazard, bow tie analysis, consequence modeling, QRA, occupied building risk alarm assessment, uh, using a variety of methods and software applications. Uh, he also has uh, a significant experience of DSEA and ATEX compliance and assessments, uh, including hazardous area classifications and drawings uh, from, a, from a range of sort of hazardous sectors. So with that, I'll hand over to David. Hello. Uh, so, yes, we're going to cover DSEA and broadly touch on the ATEX regulations today. Um, I'm going to take you through a, a very quick case study to start with, um, followed by a sort of dive into the different legislations in which sort of lead DSEA uh, in the UK and how they tie back to European regulations. Um, out of that, we're going to focus on the risk assessment portion. Uh, we'll touch on hazardous area classification and also on equipment classification suitable for use within hazardous areas. So let's start with the case study. Um, so within the UK in 2015, there was a major incident at a uh, wood, fire, wood flour mill in Bosley, which is in Macclesfield in the northwest of the UK. Um, there was three explosions initiated by a dust explosion, which lifted all of the dust on the tops of all the rafters into the air, which ignited and caused another explosion in a space next to it, which moved on to another space and caused another explosion. Um, there was a number of fatalities and a number of um, injuries from this. Uh, for detail, the picture that you see on the screen, at the very bottom you can see a, um, a small man riding basket, the arm of which is four metres long, just to give you an indication of quite how big the explosion was. Um, the site was completely devastated. Um, following the incident, the owner of the company and three of the managers were taken to court for corporate manslaughter um, because they didn't undertake suitable risk assessments for the site and didn't identify the probability of ignition um, at the site, the outcome being a fairly major 
incident. Okay, the UK and European legislation then. Within Europe, there are two primary directives, uh, the 99-92 EC or ATEX-137 directive, which is about the um, management of safety and the protection of workers from potentially flammable or explosive atmospheres. And that places the duty on the employer. Um, and there is the other side of that, which is the directive for manufacturers of equipment, 94-9 EC or ATEX-95, ATEX-10A. Um, which identifies the requirements for all the equipment and the protective systems that must be used within hazardous areas. Um, they were written up in, as you can see, in 99 and 94. They have been um, amended a number of times over the years. Um, and it's because they are directives rather than standards, it's up to the um, country in which they apply to legislate. So within the UK, we, we implemented the DSEA regulations, um, which is, the, as Steve has already said, the Dangerous Substances and Explosive Atmospheres regulations, which were developed in 2002 and have been updated a number of times since, um, to include additional um, hazards and additional materials. Um, the, the key requirement of the DSEA regulation um, is for all dangerous substances to be assessed, eliminated, or reduced in relation to any facility. Um, if you undertake a DCEA assessment and find you have no dangerous substances, then there's no requirement to take the elimination or reduction, um, but you must identify them. Um, and the intent, as with the ATEX regulations, is to reduce and control the risk of dangerous substances to people in the workforce. Um, it's incredibly important to note that the primary aim is for protection of workers and public. It does not revolve around asset or environmental damage. Um, obviously, dangerous substances have the potential, as we've seen from Bosley Mill, to cause massive amounts of asset damage. Um, however, if you protect the people predominantly, you will end up protecting the asset as well. Um, OK. So how do we how do we use the DCEA regulations? The regulations are very difficult to use because they are written for legal practice. Um, as such, there are a number of guides that are available to us. Um, the UK HSD produces a very good guide, which is a free guide, the L138. Um, guide for Dangerous Substance and Explosive Atmospheres, which is an approved code of practice, um, written back in 2002 and updated in 2015 when they adjusted some of the requirements of DCEA. Um, the other two that I'm displaying here are the uh, British European Standard 60079 for Explosive Atmospheres, um, which is the standard for how to uh, identify and undertake risk assessment for uh, dangerous substances that could lead to an explosive atmosphere. Unfortunately, that is a paid for document. Um, and there are other available guides, such as the Energy Institute, which produces the model code of practice uh, part 15, which is for area classification. Um, they also produce something named the Blue Book, which is for um, non-hazardous industries who still handle dangerous substances. Um, okay. Uh, so, the predominant areas in which I want to focus today um, is the risk assessment side of the DCEA requirements. Um, you must produce a risk assessment if you have dangerous substances at your facility. How you document that risk assessment is up to you. Um, however, there are certain things that it has to have in it. Um, so it must include an identification of all dangerous substances and all hazardous properties of those dangerous substances, um, which includes things like the flash point of the substance, the uh, auto ignition temperature. Um, all of these are readily, easily obtainable via um, the CLP database, um, which is the standard for labelling and packaging of, of materials. 
or from the material safety data sheet or the SDS. Um, the CLP has a uh, website which you can go on to to type in the chemical that you want to look up and it will give you all of the information that you need to place into a DCA risk assessment. Um, we must identify the circumstances of work associated with those chemicals, um, which means how they are used, but also how they are stored on the facility. Um, so if we were to take something like uh, ethylene oxide, the way in which it's used for sterilization, um, it comes in very large tanks normally, and it has to be, you have to prove that both your storage of those tanks is suitable as well as the movement from the storage to the location in which they're going to be used and then all the pipe work and all the rest of it associated with the use of it. Um, you also must identify all ignition sources. Um, the guide that I mentioned before from the HSC, the L138, gives a good first pass of ignition sources, types of ignition source that you should be considering. And this ranges from hot surfaces all the way through to naked flames. Um, including things like potential sparks and static electricity, um, which says, shows you quite how in-depth you have to be when undertaking a DCA assessment and how important it is to undertake a separate assessment rather than using perhaps your existing hazard register if you've undertaken a safety case um, because they don't take account of ignition sources in the same way. Um, you must also identify the people who may be harmed, um, be that workers or members of the public um, and then you have to undertake an assessment of both the likelihood and the severity of an explosion. The likelihood must take into account the likelihood of ignition as well as the likelihood of a release um, whereas a typical risk assessment would only take into account the likelihood of the hazard being released. Um, from there you have to identify the safeguards or the controls that you have in place uh, to make sure that you don't have a release, but also that you don't have ignition sources. And that can include things like hazardous area classification and classification of equipment working within those areas to limit the likelihood of an ignition source occurring. Um, because this is a UK regulation, it falls back to the um, default position within the UK of all risk must be considered as low as reasonably practicable, which means that you have to identify additional measures for consideration and apply those measures until you reach a point at which application becomes grossly disproportionate to the amount of sacrifice that you would have to undertake to install said measure. Um, that isn't fundamental within the ATEX regulations as such. Um, but within the UK it is, and it's a very good practice to undertake. Um, okay. Uh, and you must record everything that you do. It's a paramount importance that you record your risk assessment and you record the negatives as well as the positives. If you present a um, risk assessment where everything is ideal and everything works perfectly, you will be asked questions of what about the things that you didn't find. Um, by recording everything that you, you have, you will have a better demonstrable position that you have undertaken a robust risk assessment. Um, for further information, both all of that falls out of Regulation 5 of the DCA um, regulations um, and Article 4 of the ATEX regulations. Um, so, what do I mean when I say dangerous substances? Uh, so, a dangerous substance is a substance or preparation which, because of its physiochemical or chemical properties and the way it is used or is present at the workplace, creates a risk. Um, a very legalized way of saying um, that we have to consider both the chemicals that we know of but also the interactions between chemicals. If we take a um, ethylene and an argon, what happens if we bring them together? Um, a very good example of that is that when you mix ethylene and argon, nothing happens because argon is um, inert, but it should still be thought about. Um, so types of dangerous substances and types of, uh, sort of hazards that we have to consider. 
there is the explosive properties of a substance. Um, and if a substance isn't explosive at ambient temperature, does that change as it warms up? Does it change as it cools down? Um, you will often see these symbols on the sides of containers for various chemicals. Um, so I've placed them here to give you a little bit more. It, it, pre, it makes it a little bit easier for you if you understand what the symbology means. Uh, other types of dangers. Oxidizers. Materials that, if come into contact with um, other materials, will rapidly oxidize, um, causing a fire or an explosion. Or extremely flammable or highly flammable materials. Uh, materials which, under normal circumstances, would ignite, or when temperature raised, would ignite. Um, and then, as a catch-all, any other substances which could create a risk. And, and this is one that most people miss out on, any dust which could cause an explosive mixture or atmosphere. The Bosley Mill case study that we mentioned earlier was a dust explosion. They did have problems with other sources on the site, but it was predominantly dust being lifted into the air and finding the ignition source. Um, we must also, as I said before, take into account the circumstances of work, the way in which those chemicals are stored, the way in which they're used. Um, majority of sites in the UK have a COSH assessment, uh, Control of Substances Hazardous to Health, and part of that assessment feeds quite nicely into the DCA assessment. Um, so, bringing all that information together, how do we assess the risk? The most pragmatic approach we have found is by generating what we term a hazard register, um, an ATEC specific hazard register rather than your general hazard register. Um, and if any of you have ever seen a hazard register before, you will note that this takes into account the probability of a release in terms of PR and also the probability of ignition in terms of PI. Um, we also must take account of risk without controls in place versus risk with controls in place. We must provide evidence that our controls reduce the level of risk to a level that we are comfortable with. Um, the hazard register stat found that other than that follows a very similar standard approach um, as you would see in uh, sort of ISO 17776 type hazard registers whereby we have an ID number, an operation, uh, the identified risk, the consequence, the protection measures, the recommendations and the comments over on the right hand side. Um, unlike a standard hazard register, we take the controls in terms of the prevention and protection measures rather than the general controls. Um, and that is prevention of ignition sources and of releases and protection of um, people in the area if the release do, it was to occur. Okay. So moving forward from the hazard register, we if we develop a hazard register correctly, we should be able to identify the potential locations in which flammable substances may be released and the potential ignition sources in those areas. And um, that feeds on to undertaking a hazardous area classification. Uh, which falls out of Regulation 7 of DSEA um, and Regulation 4 or 5 of ATEX. Um, so, what must we do for hazardous area classification? We must classify places where explosive atmospheres may occur um, into hazardous and non-hazardous areas. It is important that we identify the non-hazardous areas as well as the hazardous areas because those are the areas in which we'll be able to operate in a uh, more relaxed approach to um, ignition sources. Um, you obviously wouldn't want to put a welding area inside a hazardous zone right next to a um, tank full of very highly flammable chemicals. Um, whereas if you're outside of that zone, you would be a hell of a lot more relaxed about undertaking that operation. Um, from that, we must classify those areas, uh, whether they are uh, highly likely to contain a flammable substance or less likely to contain a hazardous substance. Um, and that leads on to whether we, what levels of ignition protection we must put into those areas. Um, once we've identified those zones and identified the levels, and I will talk about the level, different types of zone in a minute, um, we need to start talking about the equipment that we will allow into those zones. Um, 
as of 2003, when the DSEA regulations came out, you are expected to ensure that all new equipment placed within those zones meets the requirements of ATEX. Um, if you have legacy equipment, this is equipment that dates back to installation prior to 2003, you are allowed to undertake a risk assessment specific to that piece of equipment to prove that the possibility of release or possibility of it presenting an ignition source is as, min as low as possible, practicable. Um, however, we are now in 2020. That equipment will be 17, 18 years old and would be expected to be at the end of its design life anyway, so we're seeing less and less of that occurring. Um, you must also, once you've identified these zones, mark the hazardous areas. People must know that they are entering a hazardous area, uh, be that with signage on a door or markings on the floor that suggest, that tell people that this area you cannot bring certain electrical items within. Um, the items that most people tend to carry around with them in their pocket, I'm sure we all do this, things like the mobile phone and your car keys, you never thought, think of them as potential ignition sources, but you can't take them into hazardous zones. Um, we must also verify the overall explosion safety. Uh, and this is classed as to see a verification. This is how we make sure that our hazard assessment is correct and that the zones we have chosen meet the requirements that we'd expect them to meet. Um, and the final point on there is something that's written very specifically into the um, DSEA regulations to ensure that all work clothing does not present an electrostatic hazard. It seems very, very specific. Um, however, walking in with your uh, polyester trousers or jacket on doesn't sound like a risk until you realize that you are building an electrical st electrical charge up and you could start a fire from wearing the incorrect, inappropriate clothing. Um, so how do we undertake that zoning then? Again, I will excuse me, I've skipped to the slide, uh, point you back towards the two standards, uh, the BS60079, specifically part 10, uh, part 10.1 for classification of explosive gases and part 10.2 for classification of dusts, um, gives a very good uh, technical approach for determining the size and um, type of zone that you should apply around with different equipment. Um, the other um, option is to undertake it following the Energy Institute guide. The Energy Institute guide is a little bit more pragmatic, less uh, technically focused. Um, they've done a large proportion of the assessment for you. You just have to follow the right guide within there and assuming that your process is a fairly standardized process, you can pick out sizes of zones, types of zones directly from a lookup table within there. Um, and the HC guide that I mentioned before, L138, points to either of these being acceptable. Um, the British standard was updated in 2015, um, and a number of places are still getting to grips with how to use it, whereas the um, EI 50, Part 15, fourth edition, was produced before then and has become de facto um, within various industries. So what does that mean? What zones should we be applying? There are three types of zones for hazardous substances and three types of zones specific to dusts. Um, so a zone zero within hazardous gases, hazardous liquids, is any zone where a um, flammable atmosphere is present all the time. Typically this is within storage tanks, within process streams, so on this rather nice pretty drawing, you'll note that within the petrol tank and within the storage tank below grade, there is a zone zero in the illage space. Um, this is where you are almost guaranteed to have a flammable zone. Um, the next zone is a zone one, which is where you would have potential for flammable atmospheres uh, for a period of time every year. Um, it's still fairly likely to occur. You'll note that things like around the filling point of the tank and around the car filling point is a zone one. Um, they are zones where you still have to control the ignition sources to a certain level, um, but you are allowed to put certain pieces of equipment in. You will note that the petrol pump, a uh, electronic pump is within a zone one. It meets the requirements of ATEX for operation within a zone one. Trying to find a pump 
that can operate within a zone zero is somewhat more complicated. And the last of the three zones is the zone two. And this is a more generalized zone. It's typically much larger than the other two zones. And this is a zone where there is potential for a flammable atmosphere to occur, um, but it isn't typically expected. Um, so uh, normally what you will find is a zone one with a larger zone two surrounding it. Um, there is a fourth that most people forget about, which is the non-hazardous zone, the zones that are outside of the zone. And as I mentioned before, it's critical that we identify those as well, because that gives us a little bit more of a relaxed series of controls that we'd have to put into place. Okay. So how do we how do we provide evidence that we've done this? Uh, the most pragmatic approach to undertaking hazardous zones is first to produce a table of where those zones will be, but then to also produce a drawing. Um, there is a um, specific convention drawing convention for how you mark up the zones, uh, which you can see on the screen at the moment. Um, and you will note that there is a zone zero through to zone two for gases and a zone 20 through to zone 22 for dusts. Um, both of them get handled in the same way. Uh, they, zone 20 is the equivalent to a zone zero. So that's a location where high volumes of dust will be occurring on a regular basis and zone 22 being the lesser of the um, zones in the same way that the zone 2 was. Um, and they need to be placed onto drawings. Um, so as a, an example, these drawings are taken from the Energy Institute Part 15. Um, this is the sort of level of drawing that which the HSC in the UK would expect to see uh, from you if you present hazardous areas on drawings. Um, so you will note that there is a, um, as with the other drawing, a zone one surrounding the uh, car filling point with a longer zone two surrounding the hose on an extended room. And the same for over on the left hand side, there is a zone one surrounding the outlet from the tanker and a zone one, surround, a zone one surrounding the vent from the tank. Where These are locations where we would predominantly expect a flammable substance to occur and then a wider zone two stretching out away from the tank. Um, the calculations within EI15 and BS60079 can be used to determine the size of those zones. Um, and as I mentioned before, the EI15 approach is a little bit more pragmatic um, for undertaking hazardous zone calculations. Um, so the other thing that we need to produce is termed a LIAC table or a list of equipment for hazardous area classification. Um, much like our hazard register, there is a, uh, not necessarily a defined way of doing it, but one that has become an industry norm, um, which is you, what we have presented here, uh, which presents the source of release, which must include the area, uh, description of the source of release and the grade of release. There are three types of grade, and the grade typically applies to the type of zone that ends up being applied, a uh, continuous, a primary, and a secondary, continuous linking to a zone zero, a primary usually linking to a zone one, and a secondary usually linking to a zone two. Um, we must describe the flammable material that could be released. In this case, we're talking about diesel, um, which until I'm going to say fairly recently, but it's more like five years ago, wasn't classified as a flammable material. They then reassessed the classification from materials and brought the temperature down, which brought diesel into something that we have to consider within disease. Um, and you will note that we have to take into account the operating temperatures and the pressures and the state of that liquid. Um, diesel at ambient temperature, ambient pressure or low pressure is unlikely to cause a flammable atmosphere. However, as soon as you start warming it up or you increase the pressure such that it could cause a mist, it becomes more of a um, concern as far as flammable atmospheres is. Um, we also have to consider the ventilation in the area, um, whether it's a decent amount of ventilation or if it's in a contained box or hidden away somewhere, will make a difference to the type of zone that we have to apply. Um, and then we can start talking about the hazardous area and the, what sort of reference we're using. So you'll note on the screen that all of this is done through EI15, which suggests no hazardous area for that temperature um, and pressure for diesel. Um, and that all leads on to the type of gas group or temperature class, which is the equipment classification um, that we must consider. Um, 
which leads me quite nicely on to the last of set, last set of my slides, which is the equipment classification. Um, this is the other side of the ATEX directive. This is the manufacturer's requirements um, to ensure that the equipment that they um, install uh, is suitable for use in that zone. Um, so you will often see a plate that looks very similar to this um, on the side of equipment. Uh, this one's from a pump. Um, it has been doctored somewhat to hide who manufactured the pump. Um, but you will see the CE mark up on the far left hand side, um, which is a mark that has to be put on there by an identified body who has undertaken to approve that piece of equipment suitable for use within that zone. Um, as it happens, TUV Rhineland are one of the companies that can undertake that asset. So if you ever see 0035, it's two that have done it. Um, that number is different for different people. DMV has a similar sort of thing. I think their number is 4065. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see the EX symbol um, and then a marking. Um, and the marking goes into quite a lot of detail um, as to um, what you, where you can place that piece of equipment. So if we zoom in on the marking, um, first of all, as I said before, you will have the CE marking to say it complies and the notification body, but then you will see that it details the type of equipment group that it falls underneath. Uh, equipment class two is suitable for gas. Uh, the equipment category and the environment in which it's allowed to be used. Uh, the level of pro pro explosion protection that that piece of equipment presents. Um, and the type of protection, be it completely enclosed, encapsulated, um, or ventilated. Uh, the gas group, which is the um, gas that it's allowed to operate uh, within. Uh, so 2C is a fairly um, high level explosive gas, so it, I think 2C can operate within hydrogen. Uh, the temperature class, so the ignition temperature range in which it's allowed to operate. And finally, the equipment protection level. Um, there are tables available out there that will explain about what each of those elements are if you want to dig into what your equipment is actually rated for. Um, so, as a summary, DCEA is the UK implementation of the European ATEX directives. Um, it doesn't exactly marry to the ATEX directive, however, it has taken the key elements and brought them into a UK specific regulation. Um, other countries have their own versions of this. Um, Ireland works underneath a, a specific ATEX implementation. Um, and they call it, they continue to call it ATEX. Uh, it requires a company to identify all hazardous substances it has at its facility and the ignition sources and to conduct a risk assessment of those substances and ignition sources. Um, there are various guides available uh, to aid with understanding what you must do and I highly recommend that you, if you aren't sure you go and read the HSE's L138 guideline. Um, it will give you a good basic understanding beyond this webinar um, for what this year actually means. Um, obviously I would love to be able to suggest you go and read the British standard, but I very much doubt everyone's going to be willing to go and pay for it if they haven't got a DCA risk. Um, if you have flammable or hazardous substances and ignition sources on the facility, a hazardous area classification must be undertaken. Um, and equipment that is used in those areas um, must meet the requirements of ATEX and be marked as such. Um, it is imperative that the markings remain on the equipment as a verification activity can be conducted whereby walking around site and looking at all pieces of equipment to make sure that they meet the requirements. Um, and the primary aim of DCEA is at the end of the day to ensure the safety of people who may be at risk from hazardous substances. And again, I'll say people is the primary word within that statement. It is not targeted towards asset or environmental damage. Okay. So that leads us on to questions and answers. So uh, I'm happy to take questions. I believe, Steve, you've been monitoring the um, instant messenger. Um, so if you wish to ask questions, can you please pass them through the instant messenger? Yeah, thank, thank you, David. Um, 
that, that was really good. Yeah, we, we've got a load of questions actually, so uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's a really good ones as well. A uh, question from Amanda. Um, can we demonstrate compliance with DCIA if we don't totally follow British Standard 679? Oh, yes. Uh, obviously, if you decide to follow the EI route for hazardous area classification, um, you can, but it's a very difficult path to tread, and I would suggest you would be far better following the guidance in 60079 as opposed to working against it. Okay, thanks, David. A um, question from uh, Jag. I think this was quite early on um, when we, you first mentioned dangerous substances. So he asks, dangerous substances, substances, is that with respect only to explosive events or also all chemotoxic hazards? So is this here really about so uh, as the, dangerous... As the, sorry. Yeah, go uh, as, as the uh, name of the... Um, regulation implies it's really intended to, to, to target flammable and explosive atmospheres um, rather than occupational health risks from uh, interactions with chemicals whereby uh, long-term health effects. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, from question from Eric. Um, again, I think this came in just before the slide we uh, the relevant slide, but it says no mention of SDSs, so is that the uh, safety data sheet? Safety data sheet. Where would you include these within your risk assessment? I think you yes. did mention it. I, I did. It's one of the useful locations to collect information from. It doesn't necessarily cover all information that you require for DCIA. Um, it's very rare to find an SDS that talks about the auto ignition temperature um, or the minimum ignition temperature of a chemical. However, they're a good first start. Um, so that's really where you would start using them. Um, and because the CF ties in with the cost regulations as well as mentioned, your, DC, your SDS sheets are far more likely to appear in the cost regulations. Okay, great. Um, this was Amanda's favorite question. Uh, the 2015 amendment includes gases under pressure mm -hmm. and corrosive substances within the DCIA scope. How are these being addressed in the DCIA risk assessment and other DCIA requirements? Um, so as with any of the chemicals which we're talking about within DCIA, they have to be um, identified and then assessed through the hazard identification as to what risks, what uh, hazards they present, um, what the sources are and what the controls are that you have in place. Um, they are handled in exactly the same way as flammable um, substances. Um, the corrosive is specific; is more to do with the interaction between um, non-flammable non chemicals and flammable chemicals, resulting in um, a bigger bang for your buck, shall we say? <laughs> Another question from Jag: um, To what reasonable extent should fault cases be considered as part of the identification? Sorry, could you repeat that, Steve? Yeah. Uh, to what reasonable extent should fault cases be considered as part of as part of identification. Okay, I'm a little bit unsure by the term fault cases there, yeah. but I would assume you mean what level of failure do we have to consider? Do we go from uh, to, all the way to a catastrophic failure, um, or are we talking more um, general, smaller leaks? Um, do you see it typically targets the um, smaller levels of release, the catastrophic full bore rupture resulting in a major fire is normally handled through within the UK the coma regulations um, whereas the CIA is more of the smaller releases that wouldn't necessarily meet the coma requirements but still present a hazard. And I think the next question is, is kind of related to that I think um, from Eric. A hazard log should include a detailed accident or event sequence uh, which seems to be missing from our hazard register slide. Uh, is this on purpose for to see um, Also, the consequence should provide the final outcome, which normally would be um, death. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, the, the range of consequences and the range of hazards, uh, I gave you a very short snippet of a hazard register there. Um, I have to be careful how much I can hand over, obviously. Um, but that, that, that hazard register had uh, a further 140 odd lines on there, um, ranging from the minor releases that just went 
pop all the way through to the killing people consequence levels. Um, the hazard It's not a hazard log as such, it's a hazard register. Um, so it doesn't need quite as much of a detailed level of assessment all the way back to root cause of why the hazard would be realised. Um, typically the hazard for Decia is the flammable substance. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks Dave. Um... Yeah, we keep going. We've got plenty of questions. I guess time's, <laughs> time's pushing on, but we'll just try and crack. There's still yep. plenty of people online, so we'll just keep going. Um, from Vinod, uh, it might be advisable to use the term unclassified rather than non-hazardous. True. There is, uh, there's always a risk anywhere, and nothing should really be called non-hazardous. I agree on the general terms that there is no such thing as a non-hazardous location. Um, the term non-hazardous in terms of DC means an area in which you cannot get any flammable materials released, um, such as a bike park on the corner of the uh, site where there are no flammable materials anywhere near it. Um, but by all means, unclassified is a more than acceptable term to use. Um, question from McKenzie. In risk assessment, should one consider uh, a closed drain system for hard hydrocarbons, which is only used periodically um, for maintenance and is obviously is closed, so there are normally closed valves. Okay, so there would be a potential for a zone two within that area. Uh, I don't know the facility or the uh, process, um, but if you are opening up that area to um, flammable materials, you would have to consider it as part of your DSEER assessment. A question from uh, Hong Seng. Uh, for carrying out non-hot work, mechanical overhaul work inside an ATEX Zone 2, is there a mandatory requirement for personnel to be trained? Uh, only as far as maintenance go, uh, activities go in terms of training. Um, but within a zone, you would have to undertake a risk assessment to ensure that there are no potential for flammables or for ignition sources within that zone. Uh, specific um, ignition sources I'd be concerned of are things like um, static electricity or sparks from tools um, whilst, whilst working within that zone. Okay, uh, a question from Chioke. I understand there's a relationship between the grade of release, which I think you mentioned in the um, mm -hmm. uh, in one of the slides, yeah. Yeah, uh, and the hazardous zone. Are there any deviations to this? Yes, there are always things that break the rules, I'm afraid. <laughs> Typically, a continuous release results in a zone zero. A primary release, which is a release that happens on a routine basis, would be zone one. And a uh, secondary grade release would typically result in a zone two. However, things like vent stacks, which would not normally be considered as a... Um, Second, a primary grade of release, and quite often would be considered as a secondary grade of release, if dependent on where they're venting from, may still result in a zone one, a smaller zone one surrounding them, um, to ensure that the potential for a flammable material going up the vent is considered. Question from Jag: um, Is it still acceptable to use uh, British Standard 679 2009 uh, because he believes the forward? in the 2015 standard is quite contentious. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> they, they, um, they redid the way in which you identify hazardous areas and the calculation that you have to undertake to develop hazardous areas in the 2015 version. Um, and it hasn't yet been accepted by a numerous industry bodies. Um, I would personally push you towards using EI part 15 if you can. So the Energy Institute model code of safe practice. Um, purely because I find it a far more pragmatic approach. Um, however, if you are stuck using the 2009 version, I would suggest that you uh, ensure that you have a robust argument for why you use it. Uh, very good. And um, Vinod agrees with you about using the uh, Institute's uh, Part 15 <laughs> code of practice. Um, Most people uh, do. <laughs> as does Chioke. Um, a question from uh, Jason. Uh, put your crystal ball hat on here what will happen to to see a post brexit this is a very good question and something that we are investigating at the moment and um, the biggest problem is equipment classification for use in hazardous areas which at the moment is a european standard when we leave the europe europe 
uh, we will no longer be able to apply the same standard because we are no longer part of the European Union. Um, this means that there will be um, verification bodies that will have to change the way in which they classify equipment. Um, at the moment, I'm afraid not. It's a uh, no one knows question, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Okay. I wouldn't want to lead the witness, so to speak. <laughs> yes. A um, uh, question from Amanda regarding non-electrical equipment, uh, which follows the British standard uh, 879 instead of 679. Yep. What are the equipment certification and marking requirements, uh, if you know that? Um, I would have to go and look at the standard at the, that point um, to make sure that I give you the right information. Um, they still have to be rated for use within ATEX zones, um, but I couldn't tell you what the markings have to look like for non-electrical equipment. And finally, the last question would take from Eric. Um, you did not mention corrosive substances uh, that may cause a fire. Uh, I didn't. It comes underneath the catch-all of any other substances that present a um, hazard. Um, I talked about oxidising uh, substances, um, in a, and the corrosives kind of fall out underneath that. Um, but you are correct that corrosive substances do have to be accounted for as well. Okay, um, David, thank, thanks very much for um, answering all those questions. We need to wrap up now. Um, Everybody, uh, what we will do is we'll make a recording available to uh, to everybody. Um, it'll probably be early next week now. Uh, if you do have any questions arising from what you've heard today, uh, or you like any information on any of our services, then uh, please simply email us uh, directly. There's a couple of email addresses uh, just on the slide, uh, obviously in the recording. Uh, feel free to visit our website too. Uh, so thanks again, David. Um, thank you everybody for your attention. You know, really, really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to listen in and join us in these webinars. And hopefully you can um, join in one of the other ones that are coming up shortly over the next few weeks. So uh, everybody stay safe, uh, stay secure. Thank you very much. Goodbye.